And our first speaker, Dr. Roger Stockton, is a state agronomist with the NRCS. Um, and he's going to come give us an overview of some of the programs that NRCS has to help landowners uh, work with pollinator habitat. So, um, um, just a brief bio. I farmed for 20 years ago. Then I went to graduate school and got a master's and PhD. And my lord, did they add a lot of chapters to all those science courses at the time I was part of Oh, I'm sure. But I persevered, uh, been an area agronomist for Kansas State University for five years in Northwest Kansas. Uh, been with the NRCS since then. Now the state agronomist from Wyoming and leader in our soil health education effort in the NRCS in the state. Uh, I've got several handouts on the table where the uh, plates and, and eating utensils were. Uh, a couple of them from the Surface Society, uh, farming for pollinators, and uh, bumblebee conservation. Uh, I, th these are good information, but I put them out there as much as anything so that everybody would have the web address from Xerxes Society. They are the go-to for pollinator information. So, enough of that. Uh, <coughs> NRCS programs, uh, all these programs are programs we have in place this year, the Conservation Reserve Program, administered by FSA and NRCS, Conservation Stewardship Program, EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentives Program, Agriculture Conservation Easement Programs, uh, some of the old acronym for Grassland Reserve, uh, Wetland Reserve, and Wildlife Habitat. Nearly any conservation practice that includes planting can include a pollinator plot. Uh, there are currently 38 conservation practices to facilitate <coughs> pollinator plots and other practices. So the take home message here is if you're interested in this, the local FSA service office, which includes NRCS, is the place to start. The, the local people there at the county office can look at your site, listen to what you want to do, can help you piece through this information, put together a workable plan that will do what you want it to do. Uh, <clears throat> what can be planted? I uh, put out about 25 or 30 copies of Tech Note 17. It's, it's about uh, 30 pages or so, and it's got the how to plant them, when to plant them, and then a list of varieties that have been approved by the Plant Materials Center in Georgia, Montana for this area. They aren't the only things that will grow here, and certainly other things can be added to that, but all those have been tested out in Georgia. Um, the whole idea is let's use as many native plants as possible. Let's get variety out there. We want stuff blooming early in the spring. We want it blooming mid-spring, summer, mid-summer, late summer, fall, as late as it can go into fall, so that there's a food source for these pollinators for the entire growing season, so that you encourage them to colonize and stay there. <clears throat> uh, you can use shrubs or trees for early bloomers. Lilac, for instance, makes a great early bloomer for, for the early start of the, of the pollinator season. Uh, cover crops for pollinators. Uh, we're working with a number of different producers and, and the idea is beginning to pick up a little bit of steam of planting multi-species cover crops or cover crop cocktails as they call The whole idea is a lot of our farmland has been a monoculture of one or two crops and that leaves the soil very devoid of life. There are only a few organisms that specialize in whatever you grow by getting that diversity of cropping back into it, whether it's as a short season cover crop or maybe you add one year to rotation, make it a year longer rotation of the cover crop. The cover crop really invigorates the soil biology. Uh, we have concentrated on soil chemistry and a little on soil physics for about eight years. We just about sterilized a lot of the soil in the process as far as biological life. And we find when we get the soil biology working in harmony, 
then we produce healthy plants, we produce healthy animals, and we have a thousand pollens. But it starts with the soil. So things that can be used in a pollinate in a cover crop planting, uh, buckwheat, flax, sunflower, safflower, cassilia, uh, the flower mixes, uh, the various things that go in there usually will have 20 to 30 percent grasses in there for better erosion protection. And they pollinate too. They provide a short time of pollination. Uh, strip cropping, this was taken a year and a half ago uh, in the southeastern corner of the state. And this was strips of wheat, strips of bare ground, and there was a wheat system driving out. And uh, hard to tell where, where one starts and other shops. So this is an issue that a lot of those strips have become too wide. And so the thought of a, a solution here would be a 30 foot wide strip of cover crops on the upper side of each strip. You may need a second one halfway across on the wider strips, but it'll form an extra wind barrier on the, on the upwind side of it to lessen the effect of the wind across the plot. Um, don't harvest the cover crop, but it stand through winter, provides good wildlife, benefit through the winter because there's some heat produced there. The birds and the rodents and various things really clean up on that. Uh, NRCS financial assistance will vary depending upon what practices you and the local field office decide to use. Uh, but almost always there will be enough financial assistance to pay for the seed and to give you a good workable plan of how to do it and, and help in getting everything put together. So again, see your local field office here in Sheridan or in Buffalo or Tuet, wherever you're at. And then I threw in a little color here of some of the plants that go into pollinator plantings. Alfalfa and wild bee balm. Aster and blanket flower. Also called Gaylardia. Uh, small burnet butterfly bush. It's worked very well. A clover and columbine. Brian's still eating, it's almost in perfect good shape. <laughs> Coneflower and flax. Globe mallow and milk mesh, size of milk mesh. Very common flower and sunflower. Sweet clover, bird's foot tree full. It's been a good year for the sweet clover. Yeah. <laughs> Western yarrow and buffalo berry. Buckwheat and nankeen cherry. Buckwheat blooms almost the entire season. Starts blooming about five or six weeks after you plant it and will go just about till frost. Choke cherry and clematis. Golden currant, dogwood redosier. Or redosier if you're smoking home like I am. <coughs> Elderberry and honeysuckle. Black hawthorn and lilac. American plum and rabbit bush. Purple sage and Russian sage. The Russian sage is not native, but it's well adapted here. Again, we like things to be native, but they, it's not a make or break rule if, if things are adapted like, and they're not likely to spread. A Western sand cherry, service berry. Snowberry and skunk bush sumac. And that was the end of those remarks. <laughs>